Howdy, everybody. For all of those who have stuck through this set of lectures on uncertainty, man, awesome. That's what I'm talking about. Tenacity, sticking it out. That's great. So let's go ahead. We're going to finish right now. We'll talk about how to summarize over realizations. Now, there's much we can do with uncertainty. There's much with uncertainty modeling, but summarizing over realizations is a very powerful way to communicate uncertainty. It tells us about local local uncertainty and we can produce very impactful maps, illustrations, summarizations using these types of methods. So we'll go ahead and show that. We work with multiple realizations. We admit in order to get the job done, it is not appropriate to work with one or too few representations of the subsurface. We have to work with these multiple models. Now, we need a simple, practical methodology to visualize over multiple models so that we can communicate over them. And so, we have de we developed methods such as local uncertainty maps to provide measures of local uncertainty that's su suitable to supporting decision making. We'll talk more about decision making shortly in another lecture. All right, so I will just simply list and display a variety of different local measures, but all of them are doing exactly the same thing. They're going to a location within the model. They're taking all of the results, all of the realizations at that location. If they're from multiple scenarios, you may be waiting based on the probability of each scenario, or it may be all equal likely. If it, you're just pulling them together and building a local distribution of uncertainty, a local CDF. And so this is pretty straightforward. We're going to scan over all the realizations and scenarios. We're going to calculate the local distributions of uncertainty at each location, and we'll calculate a statistical summary over each location and place it on a map, if 2D, a model, if 3D. Pretty straightforward, right? And so what is the specific percentile outcome at this location right here? Go through all of the realizations, compile the CDF, use the percentile transform, the inverse of the CDF, and get the associated percentile at that location, U alpha. Simple. What is the local? probability of exceeding a specific threshold. You'll notice I just changed the equation. There was a bit of a switch because I forgot something, but we've got it right now. We know that the probability of exceeding that threshold will just be equal to one minus the forward of the cumulative distribution function for the specific value at that location. Assemble the CDF just like we did before. We can go ahead and calculate the probability of being less than that threshold by using the forward of the distribution, the CDF, take one minus that, and we have the probability of exceeding a threshold at that location. What did these maps look like? Let me show you some very simple illustrations of these maps. And so let's take multiple realizations. Here's nine realizations of porosity. If you look really closely, you will see that there's conditioning data, about a hundred of them or so, short range of spatial continuity, multiple realizations, not too much astonishment. They are different away from the data. They're the same at the data locations. These were built using the Geostat Pi package for Python. And I can point to the specific workflow where I did this in a little bit. Now, what you can do is you can go through and calculate an E-type. That would be the first statistic we'll consider. An E-type is the local expectation. If they're all equally likely, then it's just the average of the L realizations at each location. Now, if we do that, we can immediately see that we have a nice smooth map equal to the data values at the data locations. That makes sense. The uncertainty is zero at the data locations. It's always the data value. The average of, the, of a constant is equal to the constant. And away from the data, it will change low, high, uh, kind of short scale spatial continuity. We go very close to the average. We have a little bit of fluctuations, but probably because we just don't have enough realizations. A conditional expectation, we will calculate the variance of the samples. Now, first observation that the data locations, it should be equal to zero, the black values within the color bar. That's happening. You can see that. Away from the data, it should rise up and it should become maximal at the range away from the data locations. 
Yeah, but in general, there'll be a bit of a change. It won't be quite as straightforward as, say, a Kriegen variance because of the fact that we have a Gaussian transform back and forth with the Gaussian-based simulation that this is based on. Also, we clearly do not have enough realizations. There's still a lot of fluctuation. The variance is going to be a sensitive statistic more than the mean, and so there'll be quite a bit of fluctuation still. We would want to run many more realizations to smooth that out to really get a good indication. The local P10, P50, and P90. These are not P10, P50, P90 models, but the local. This is a P90 right now here. What we've done is that every single location, we calculate, assemble the CDF, and we draw at each location the P10. These are really powerful because if we look at a local P10 model, if the value is already high in the P10 model, then we have a 90% chance that we're even higher. If we go to a P90 model and the value is already kind of low, we have a 90% chance of being even lower, a surely low location, a surely high location. Local P10 models, very powerful. Now, if you want to try out this methodology for visualizing local uncertainty, which in, in GSLib is part of a program called PostSim, I have recoded PostSim within Python, included it, Oh, not yet included in geostat.py, but it's embedded within the workflow. This workflow is available on GitHub, and you can download it, run it for yourself, and try out a little model summarization. Super powerful stuff for understanding uncertainty. Let me do the concluding remarks on uncertainty, provide a little bit of a summary right now, and we can be done with uncertainty for now. That was a lot, a lot of information to share. I hope it was helpful. Make some points here to wrap up. First of all, how do we calculate uncertainty model parameters? We did not really go into that. We didn't give the details, but guess what? All that good probability maps, statistics, frequentist, Bayesian methods, bootstrap, all of the stuff that we've covered previously can be used to assess uncertainty in the statistics and parameters that we use within our model we will still probably want to rely on some degree of expert knowledge. We should be checking with expert knowledge for sure. We often can't be just data driven. There's interpretation in the subsurface. If you know it, put it in. Use expert geologic knowledge in the data to model the trends. Use it to model different parts of regions, segment the model into things that are distinctly different. If you put something into the trend, it becomes known and is removed from the unknown. It's no longer an uncertain component of the model. If you overfit the trend, you will produce a model where you fool yourself that you know more than you really know. But if you do not put what you know into a model, you will leave it to statistics and chance probability for it to be actually reproduced. If you know it, put it in. Types of uncertainty, just a review. Data measurement, calibration, uncertainty. The measures themselves. The decisions and parameters in the model are also uncertain. Spatial uncertainty, even if we know the data, we know the decisions, we know the parameters, we still don't know what's going on exactly between the well locations. It's our job to be an uncertainty sleuth, to hunt, to be a detective, to find meaningful, significant sources of uncertainty and make sure we address them. If they're important to the transfer function, they should be included in the model. Be an uncertainty detective. Discover and evaluate various sources of uncertainty. What about uncertainty in the uncertainty? I'll let that sink in for a bit. Boom. Blows your mind, right? What did the great scientist and geostatistician Andre Janelle tell us? When faced with this question, he said, don't go there. Use defendable choices in your uncertainty model. Mathron, in estimating and choosing, talks to great detail about how we can build models that are defendable by removing all of the choices that cannot be supported, building models that can be supported given the available information. But in general, let's be conservative about what we know Quantify uncertainty as best as we can, document it, 
and move on. Uncertainty is a model. There's no objective uncertainty. It's up to us to do the best to build models. And you remember what Box told us about models. All models are wrong, some are useful. All right, uncertainty depends on scale. It's much harder to predict over a teaspoon, a very small cubic centimeter or something of the subsurface, than to predict over a volume of, say, a house, a building, the entire reservoir. This is because of the fact that you can imagine that over a very large volume, there's many small volumes. And if you calculate the effective property over a large volume, there will tend to be a regression to the mean. That is, at large volume support, the variance shrinks. The uncertainty in the estimate shrinks. Okay, you cannot hide from uncertainty. Ignoring uncertainty assumes certainty. And this is often extreme and a dangerous assumption. If you don't quantify uncertainty in a model parameter and you've set as constant, you have assumed certainty. Can't put your head in the sand. You've got to face it. Decision making with uncertainty, you've got to apply all the models to the transfer function to calculate the uh, uncertainty in the subsurface outcome to support your decision making in the presence of uncertainty. You've got to apply all the models. As Deutsch told us in his speaking tour, all the models all the time. Ignoring uncertainty is assuming certainty. All right, so that's the end of our discussion about uncertainty. It's a fascinating discussion. It's broad. There's much that we did not cover. We could probably have a course on uncertainty. I hope this was useful. This was helpful. We covered a mix of some theoretical considerations, not too deep in the theory, kind of an entry level on the theory, but we did cover a lot of the practical workflows and ideas. Well, as usual, I am Michael Perch. That hasn't changed. That's certain. And I am the associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Appreciation to my graduate student, Julian Salazar, who told me I must record this video if I can even expect to give some type of a quiz, quiz next week in class. So I kept my promise. I recorded this lecture to support my students in a quiz next week. I will get back and record a bunch of the lectures I've missed. I have been so busy. I've taught at like six different companies, I think, in the last two months, in addition to a lot of teaching, a lot of coding with the GeoStatPy package. And my graduate student count is now getting up to about 11 PhDs. And so I am becoming very, very busy. Plus, I have an open door policy with all the students in my class. And my graduate level course is full with a lot more students than I expected. And so I'm very busy, but I will record as I can. All right, that was wordy. Um, thank you very much for paying attention. I hope this was helpful. Reach out, I'm always happy to discuss. So everyone, all right, thank you, take care.